Hey guys, um, you are going to start this week on um, a new standard. You are starting on SS8H6A, which is the events leading to the Civil War, so the causes of the Civil War. So right now you should have beside you your notes um, ready to fill in the blank so that you can have those with you when you are taking the quiz um, later on this week. So we have talked about moving out of, or the people of Georgia moving further west, um, the people of the United States moving further west and westward um, expansion uh, with the last unit. And we know that there's a lot of differences that divided the North and the South states long before the Civil War started. Um, two of these, um, the most important that we're going to talk about is your state's rights and slavery. So during the 1800s, we know here in the South that farming is the way of life. Everybody is making money off of farming, um, especially cotton. Um, but in the North, you are going to see more factories being built. North wanted to sell their goods in the South, but it's cheaper for the Southerners to import their goods from Europe. So even though the North is a lot closer to us, the North was selling them for way more than what other pe other places around the world were selling different products. So in 1828, President Jackson, now remember President Jackson is also the one that um, kicked the Cherokee, the Native Americans out of Georgia, started the Trail of Tears, same President Jackson. He put a tariff on imported goods to help northern industries, which means it is now more expensive for the South to buy goods from Europe than it is from the North. The Southerners did not like this idea. They opposed this tariff. Remember, a tariff is a tax. Um, because when it was put in place to help the Northern businessmen, um, they didn't put it in place to help the Southern plantation owners. It was there put in place to help the North. Um, so in South Carolina in 1832, they invoked the doctrine of nullification. Nullification means void. It is void. They said this tariff was not valid in their state. They threatened to withdraw from the Union. Because they threatened to withdraw from the Union, Congress lowered the tariff in 19, or sorry, 1833. So we also have the issue of states' rights. A lot of Southerners are angry because they believe the national government is intruding on those states' rights. Okay, so um, the states believe that the, st the people of the state, the governments of the state, believe that the states have the right to govern what goes on inside their own borders. So, for instance, the state of Georgia. They believe that our people have the right to govern what goes on in the state of Georgia, that the federal government should not have any say-so in that. Um, so, a lot of states in the South believe that they, that they could choose which federal laws to obey and which ones not to obey. If they didn't like a law that the, pa the federal government passed, then they said, no, nah, we don't have to follow it. Um, and they believe that the states could withdraw or succeed from the Union if they chose to do so. Okay, just so you know, a state cannot say they are not going to follow a federal law. If a federal law is put in place by our national government, then all states have to follow it. But that's not what they believed. Um, another issue that we see in the 1800s is slavery. Slavery is going to be a very heated issue between the North and the South. By the 1800s, the North had gotten rid of slavery for the most part. They're moving more towards factories, relying on factories, relying on businesses. That industrial revolution. And they did not need the slaves in order to maintain their economy. It's completely different here in the South. The South's relying on cash crops. The South is relying on farming. 
um, those, especially those crops like cotton, they depended heavily on slave labor or that free labor to work those larger plantations. And you can see here, um, this picture was taken in 1862. This was taken taken in um, on a South Carolina plantation, and these slaves are farming sweet potatoes. And then here, this was taken on a street in Atlanta in the 1860s, and you can see this is a slave auction. A lot of your northern abolitionists, they're going to speak out against the evils of slavery. They're wanting it to end, while the southerners are wanting to protect their way of life. Um, both sides are concerned about slavery in new territories because eventually those um, new territories will be able to send representatives to Congress, and they didn't want Congress to be off balance. Whichever side has the most members in Congress would have the advantage in making the laws, um, especially when it comes to slavery. Okay, again, this is uh, four generations of slaves in South Carolina. This is from 1862. Okay. So when we talk about those arguments with the territories, I want you to look on, at your map on this sheet of, um, that looks like this on your sheet of paper. And I want you to answer these three questions. How many states existed in 1810? I want you to write your answer on your sheet of paper. If you need to pause this for a second, please pause it. How many territories do you see? Again, if you need to pause it at this point so you can count. And then your last question, look at what is Alaska, which is this right here, Alaska, in the bottom left of the map. Why do you think it is called Russian America? I'll write your answer in the space provided. Again, if you need to pause right here, that is fine. Please pause. Um, to get your answers written down before you go on to the next slide. So the Missouri Compromise, um, this is issues, again, revolving around issues of slavery and tying in with the um, concept of states' rights. So you have controversy, controversy after controversy, widening the gap. Forty years, members of the U.S. Congress tries to close those wounds. Um, and they're doing it with band-aids. So you can see here, this is what we're looking at in the beginning. This is the map of the U.S. in the beginning. Let's look at our first compromise in 1820. First compromise, compromise of 1820. Look at this map. It says, examine the map closely. What two states were added in the compromise of 1820? And I want you to name those two map, those two states, sorry. How many total states are there in 1820? Again, pause the video if you need to pause it. How many states are free states? How many states are slave states? Look at your um, key in the bottom. You will see that red is slave states. Green is free states. And then the Compromise of 1820 establishes the Missouri Compromise Line, which is the southern border of Missouri. I find my mouse right here. By looking at the Arkansas Territory and the Unorganized Territory, make an assumption about the purpose of the Missouri Compromise. What do you think this line right here was for? What was the purpose of this line? Write your answer in the blank. If you need to pause it, feel free to pause it while you're writing your answer.
1820, Congress approves that Missouri Compromise. This compromise is an effort to appease the North and to appease the South. The slave state of Missouri applied for statehood. It applied to become a state. But it would upset the balance between free states and slave states. There was an even number of both. So if Missouri comes in as a slave, slave state, now there's going to be more slave states. The plan was to admit Missouri as a slave state and then admit Maine as a free state. It also stated that all new states north of that line, north of the Missouri Compromise line, would be free states. All states south of that spot or that point would allow slavery. Let me take a minute. understand what the Missouri Compromise is and why it's so significant in American history, we have to take it back about 200 years. Now, let me set the stage for you. The year is 1820. The U.S. is a young nation with 22 states, 11 free states in the north, and 11 slave states in the south. But this balance is called into question when Missouri, a piece of land acquired from the Louisiana Purchase, wanted to be admitted into the Union as a slave state. Slavery was a highly contentious issue in the U.S. at this point. Some were pushing for the total abolition of slavery, while others looked to expand it. This issue pinned families and states against each other, creating a powder keg just waiting to explode. With tensions already high, the idea of Missouri entering as a slave state prompted heated debate in Congress, and throughout the nation too. Not just about Missouri, of course, but also how slavery factored into all future states and the future of the nation. Many argued over whether Congress even had the right to spread or limit slavery in the United States at all. While Northerners argued Congress should be allowed to prohibit slavery, Southerners insisted on popular sovereignty, the idea that it should be up to the states to determine this for themselves. These sentiments sound familiar? The biggest sticking point of the debate was political power. You see, Missouri's entrance as a slave state would throw off the balance of power in Congress. So to keep things even, Congress hashed out a separate solution, a compromise of sorts. In exchange for Missouri's admission as a slave state, the northern territory of Maine would be admitted as a free state. This ensured equal representation between the north and the south. A second part of the compromise banned slavery throughout the remaining Louisiana Purchase territory, north of latitude line 3630. But while the Missouri Compromise limited the spread of slavery, it did nothing to abolish slavery in states that already had it. So while in some ways it staved off a civil war, it was only because it just maintained the status quo. The admission of Missouri as a slave state only fanned the flames of the national debate over slavery, a fierce disagreement that wouldn't be resolved until the end of the Civil War. Young people in large... All right, so take a moment and look at your last map. Um, and this is the Compromise of 1850. And I want you to answer the five questions that are on the, that go with this map. List at least five changes that occurred between 1820 and 1850. So look between the two maps. How has this number of slave and free states changed from 1820 to 1850? What two things happened to the Arkansas Territory? Look closely at the boundary lines. And what new states were added in 1850? How are, or sorry, number five, how are the Utah and New Mexico territories different from the other states and territories? I want you to take a few moments and answer those five questions looking at this map. 